the first session is going to cover an announcement we made just two days ago, the first day at Summit, about Aerospike Database 5. And uh, on that ses uh, speaking session, you will have Srini Srinivasan, a founder and a chief product officer for Aerospike. You'll also have Lindsley and Zarling, our chief strategy officer here at Aerospike. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks yesterday, we're delighted to have Don Hatterley with us. He uh, was with IBM for many years, oversaw their data management solutions business, was a vice president and chief technology officer there, happens to be an IBM fellow, very distinguished gentleman and known among the database circles as the father of DB2. So uh, that particular session will focus in on Aerospike Database 5 and some of the highlights um, of that announcement. Hi, welcome to um, our, our session on latest innovations um, here at Aerospike 2020. You, you know, there's no hindsight required this year. Everything's 2020. Um, and so we're going to be talking with uh, Srini Srinivasan and Don Hatterley about what we've been working on here. I'm Lindley Hinserling. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Aerospike. And, um, we're also honored to have one of our longtime advisors here with us, Don Hatterley. Don is famous in the database world as the father of DB2, but much more than that, he's had a long career at um, IBM where he really drove them towards becoming an innovator in system software that cut across uh, multiple platforms. He's an ACM fellow and an IBM fellow and, and a good all around fellow as well. Um, and Srini uh, is interesting and, and drives us in terms of database uh, theory and database knowledge. He's one of those University of Wisconsin guys, and if you follow database, you will know that that is the database school um, for people to go to graduate school at. Um, you know, Srini, um, we're seeing uh, customers use Aerospike as a core database solution in handling real-time event-based transactions, and, you know, we put in um, strong consistency, you know, back with the 4.x release. Um, we're now moving on to, to strengthening that and providing more capability there. And we're announcing Aerospike multi-site clustering, uh, supporting strongly consistent geographically distributed transactions. Um, we're also going to talk about what we're doing for global um, handling of data um, for global enterprises and touch on a few other things as well. So uh, do you want to start with, uh, you know, talking about the areas you've focused on in the engineering work you've done this year, as well as uh, get into some of the, the work we've done around multi-site clustering? Thank you, Lenly. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to be here at the third annual Aerospike Summit. We just announced Aerospike Database 5 today. And the most important feature that we're announcing with it is our support for global distributed transactions through multi-site clustering. Aerospike, as you know, is a cluster database which has the ability to horizontally scale. What we have done with this feature of multi-site clustering is enable geographically distributed clusters with the racks installed in multiple sites, all working together as a single cluster to provide a strongly consistent solution, which is both linearizable and has no data loss. We've also simplified some of the um, normal application related conflicts, detection and resolution by completely avoiding conflicts. And what we believe this particular feature will do is accelerate business processes that typically uh, takes a long time to something which can be had in real time or near real time. Thus enabling businesses to run active active systems, which can run uninterrupted in the presence of even site failures. Additionally, with Aerospike database five, we're also releasing an update to our cross data center application which provides a more seamless geo-distributed data management where multiple clusters can synchronize data to each other in asynchronous manner. And this new XDR 
is implemented using a last update time based mechanism as opposed to having a log of transactions, which was a prior implementation. This implementation enables a lot more flexibility and allows XDR to be a real data hub connecting multiple Aerospike and non Aerospike systems, both systems of record and edge systems. Along with this, we have also implemented a number of developer oriented features in terms of probabilistic data types and document oriented um, support with complex data types and some enhancements to scans. And this is again in a long line of improvements we continue to do for developers. Uh, Don, you know, we, we've been working on this uh, model of strong consistency and now we've got it geographically distributed and, and geographically distributed um, strongly consistent transactions have been sort of a holy grail, if you will, um, in database. You know, Google did work in the past uh, few years on this um, to, to get there and, and a lot was made of that and that was in the relational database space. We're, we're, we've completed this work uh, in the NoSQL, uh, more distributed uh, clustered model. Um, what do you think the, uh, this, this really means and can you, can you put the work that Serena and his team have done into perspective for us? So transactions and, and databases evolved, actually were born in the 1960s into the early 1970s, along with strong consistency. And prior to strong consistency, if there was a failure, then partial writes would happen and you had to go and deal with those operationally and programmatically. And so what strong consistency brought to the table was all the changes made to a single transaction either happened or they did not happen. Okay, so we get simple. As relational databases came about in the 1970s, they adopted that model. The networks were too slow for us to be able to do uh, any kind of distributed database until the late 80s, early 90s. And so distributed databases arrived in the early late in the 80s and early 90s, but network was still too slow and the computers were too slow for us to really distribute transactions. So the eventual consistency model arrived, which was okay, is okay, but it still creates all the problems of operational and programmatic to deal with faults and failures. As we moved into the 19, into the 2000s, so the strong consistency was the more desirable model and as we evolved into the 2000s, we had a combination of three things that I saw. Network speeds improved dramatically in latency. The second was database schema architectures evolved. And the third was microservices, allowing us to take a large class of trans applications and support a strong consistency model, which is the most desirable because it creates the least faults to deal with the least faults to deal with. And that's what is the uh, current uh, multi-clustering uh, is doing here, multi-site clustering is doing. It is providing that capability for today. Yeah, so, so, so that's a great statement of it. The, the thing that we see customers really, really, you know, demanding is to have a consistent uh, transactional view across their global set of transactions that are going on and and for companies that are operating on a national and international basis um, this really adds something to, to the to the deck for them um, Srini um, do you want to add anything to that or do you want to talk about uh, our other motion with uh, global uh, data management uh, with our new uh, release of uh, our XDR technology, our cross data center technology. Yeah, let me talk about how uh, failure handling is gonna work in the multi-site clustering um, case. And then I will talk a little bit about the data hub architecture with uh, the new XDR. I've shown here, you know, I'm trying to illustrate an example based on a single aerospike cluster arranged in the form of three racks distributed across three sites 
They could be data centers, they could be cloud regions, they could be even different cloud regions. One of them could be on Amazon cloud versus Google cloud versus Azure or data centers. So you could now run a single uh, cluster across these in multiple racks. And for the purpose of simplicity, I have shown a picture with three sites and three racks each, one, one rack per site and three replicas. And as I already mentioned, we support strong consistency with linearizable isolation and no writes are lost. This is, caused by, this is done by synchronous replication with a two-phase commit like algorithm. In this particular case, there are three racks and all the three racks, all the nodes in these racks, there are three of them in every rack. All nine nodes form a cluster. And there is a definition of the cluster called the roster, which lets every node in the cluster know what are the nodes which form a full cluster. And local applications are able to essentially access the data in the local rack. Since the rack has a single, it is, since I have specifically said there are three sites and three replicas, each rack has a full copy of the database and the local access can go to the local rack for reads. For writes, all transactions are coordinated across all three of the racks or sites. Let's see what happens when a site gets disconnected. There are several other possible failure cases which we handle, but I want to take a case which is not too simple, but it's also not too complex, so it's easy to explain in a short time. In this particular case, rack three has become disconnected from racks one and two in a clean way. You know, all connections from rack three are lost. Rack three is still up, all nodes are up, forming a subcluster of three nodes. In this particular case, it is very simple for racks one and two to discover that rack three is out and form a cluster with six nodes, which, beca which becomes a majority subcluster, resulting in complete availability since it has two copies within the subcluster and a third copy is automatically created on every write as the system proceeds um, to take transactions. Now, every transaction that was committed in rack three is also committed in rack one and rack two. Only then will we take those transactions forward. What this means is we can continue the system. The system can continue with absolutely no operator intervention. Local apps on racks one and rack two continue to work fine. The local apps on rack three will become unavailable. Again, using the strong consistency algorithm of Aerospike, rack three is able to determine from a combination of the roster and the fact that it can't talk to racks one and two, that it is a minority cluster, which essentially has to take itself out of availability. And that's exactly what happens. And when the rack three comes back, uh, gets reconnected back to the other two racks, uh, the extra copies of data that have been created in racks one and two for writes that have happened will be properly merged back into rack three. So rack three can start taking over its portion of the load. So as you can see, what we can do in you know, Aerospike in multi-site cluster formation can essentially continue with no operator intervention and with conflict avoidance and uh, complete consistency um, for uh, during site failures. A few words on XDR as a data hub. With the additional features that we have added to XDR in terms of enabling dynamic configuration of source and target um, links, as well as um, the ability to um, communicate with non-Aerospike databases, what we can now have is Aerospike acting as a full-fledged data hub. Aerospike already has the ability to create subsets of data which can be shipped to different locations. We plan to enhance some of these features later in the year, but what you can now do is to have subsets of data stored in the edge system as well as the query and reporting store uh, from a system of record which could store all of the data. Yes, Sri, really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to think of Aerospike as a data hub and it's a natural for that because what we see is people using us at the edge for high ingestion rate and to capture data and not lose those fast incoming events. And now we can do data augmentation and data routing 
um, and put it into the right places, not only in other clusters of our own database, but into other um, data stores, um, whether that be uh, a data warehouse or, or pushing it back into uh, microservices that then take it into uh, an enterprise application um, that may be um, even on a mainframe. It, Don, it, you know, we have two, two versions, one synchronous and one asynchronous here to handle uh, the, the movement of global data and the replication so that you have all the data where you need it. And, and it's quickly accessible. Um, but it might help uh, people in the audience understand why would you have two versions of what might sound similar? So oh, Freeney well articulated the, uh, the first, which is distributing data uh, out, which is asynchronous. It could be that the location isn't alive and then comes alive at a certain time. Uh, or that the load on a central system from reads would be too high, or you really want to integrate it with other information as in a data lake or a data warehouse. Okay, so that it is a distribution mechanism for shipping data out or shipping data in, where the date where the, the the data may may not be a little stale and the time difference is okay. The second use of asynchronous is for the typical high availability disaster recovery. So that scenario still lives here. The synchronous replication does pay some penalty on the rights. The penalty on the rights could be up to 100 milliseconds if you had a system that had extremely high localized ingestion, lots of rights. It could be that it couldn't tolerate the, the 100 millisecond delay. So there are certain workload performance that a synchronous replication eh, doesn't work out. Asynchronous does. And there may be a slightly elongated recovery time for failure, failover, but it allows you to create a system of high availability and disaster recovery for those type of workloads. So it serves the two purposes that I see. One is the, certainly the most desirable is the synchronous replication, the strong consistency. That is absolutely the most desirable. But it does have a little performance penalty for rights. So if you had a super heavy write system, especially with hotspots, then you might have to go over and use the alternative, which is asynchronous, and then deal with the, the idiosyncrasies of that kind of a solution. Yeah, so, 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 so it's really interesting that we're giving customers choice, and you will, to solve different problems, but also choice in solving the same problem where they have that heavy rights scenario, but that just moves some responsibility to the programming staff or the operational staff at the customer because they have to contend with conflict resolution and, and dealing with those. And, and that's, that's kind of the norm now. So we've given them another arrow in the quiver, as you will. Srini, your thoughts on that? I mean, one of the things that um, we've always wanted to do in Aerospike ever since we started um, on this project was to provide customers with choice be it choice in terms of the hardware that they wanted to use, uh, which fits uh, various form factors. For example, we support an Aerospike uh, a hybrid memory architecture where you can store indexes in DRAM or persistent memory with data in flash or persistent memory for that matter, or even rotational disk if it's a pure in memory system. But the flexibility that we have provided our customers in the area of uh, hardware usage especially storage usage has been very useful to, you know, for, for our customers. Similarly, we wanted to also always wanted to provide uh, choices in terms of distributed uh, data management, both synchronous, asynchronous, you know, for those who can choose rights, um, you know, low latency rights over uh, strong consistency. You know, those are the choices we are now able to provide uh, with a full complement 
of distributed um, database features, uh, including multi-site clustering, XDR, and so on. Oh, great. Right. So um, are, are there any other things you'd like to, to touch on around the, the developer stuff? I know that one thing that we've seen is more uptake um, in terms of uh, the use of Spark against our system. And we've recently done some things in the database uh, to accommodate that for, for partition uh, focused or based uh, scans. Yeah, this is, is definitely a very interesting and important development in Aerospike. Aerospike um, essentially uses a divide and conquer algorithm by split in by partitioning the database into four four K partitions, four forty ninety six partitions, and each of those partitions are then manipulated uh, with masters and replicas and so on. What we have done recently with scans is introduce the ability to have a partition level scan capability. What this means is. Uh, scans in Aerospike can now perform uh, in parallel. Essentially, uh, it can be 4K in parallel. And what we have found is by aligning the um, hyper parallelism of accessing on a, a database on a per partition basis for scans, we can align it with other systems like Spark, which could have multiple processes working uh, concurrently. So if we can align the parallelism, maybe let us say 100 uh, Spark processes with uh, you know, 100 way uh, partition scanning, uh, we have found that we could potentially scan um, 100 terabytes of data um, in you know, under two hours, for example. And those are uh, certain problems that, that are used uh, essentially for generating new models um, in, in, in machine learning uh, algorithms and aerospike data can now be used for those models. And essentially the advantage here is the amount of data that can be stored in Aerospike is much larger than the amount of data which can fit in main memory. And this is the advantage that tools like Spark will get by using partition-based scanning. And, and it strikes me that the hyperlog log work that, that you've done with your group, uh, adding that new data type, probabilistic data types, that serves a similar need where you have millions of customers maybe touching a website and you want to get a unique count and you want to do A, a to B testing, you can actually do that in, in an incredibly reduced amount of time given the way those algorithms work. Do you, do you want to touch on that just for a second? Right, the advantage is uh, can you make decisions on large amounts of data without actually storing the data itself? And probabilistic data types um, essentially allow one to do that. So where they can basically multiplex certain kinds of, um, I would say, Boolean operator, operations on, um, on various uh, larger level keys, for example, and map it to a smaller uh, amount of data size. So uh, uh, the status for a billion records uh, could essentially be stored in a very small amount of uh, number of bits. And this is essentially what we can exploit. So many times what happens is, uh, there is a level of optimization, which is um, which results in some level of loss of certain information. But what we can get is we can get certain kind of correctness in terms of absence, for example, which might be the more interesting thing for many cases. If, if a particular user is on the site or not, and you may not want to know, um, you know, and, and if you can quickly figure that out, then you could make certain actions on maybe a billion user database by just storing maybe uh, a few gigabytes of data. And, and learning about intersections of, of demographic groups, too, in short amounts of time. Right. Through, through, the, through the other operations, yeah. So, so great. Um, what about some, some last comments, you know, from both you, uh, Srini, and, and from Don about the progress of um, the Aerospike database in getting to where it really supports um, the workloads of large enterprises that are that are operating you know, nationally and internationally and globally? When we started Aerospike, we were routinely handling maybe you know, 10 terabyte size databases. You know, over the years, we've grown to petabytes in terms of access on the primary index. Uh, we continue to improve our secondary indexes. We continue to improve various other parts of the database support for uh, persistent memory, which was added recently and so on. So all of this uh, has um, allowed Aerospike to do two things. One is uh, the server compression that is created by Aerospike 
for example, keeps um, increasing in the sense that uh, compared to other databases, we can typically compress um, uh, clusters by, you know, four X or so, uh, pretty much on a routine basis at scale. However, with persistent memory, uh, what we have been able to do is to compress uh, far more aerospike deployments by another three or four X, because the persistent memory can basically amount to almost six terabytes per uh, node. So this kind of storage and um, innovation, as well as some networking innovations, which where we have shown about 15 million transactions per second on a node, uh, essentially what this means is Aerospike is able to handle more and more uh, data, uh, especially um, you know, in real time. So that evolution continues to happen with the multi-site clustering, we're expanding it to a distributed case you know, with XDR, uh, as well as these developer features that we talked about, including probabilistic data types, which is expanding the um, scale as well as the type of applications that can use Aerospike on large amounts of data. Do you want to do you want to comment uh, on that as well? The progress of Aerospike. Um, you you've been an advisor for the company um, from from near the inception, so you you've seen us progress and progress both in the types of customers and the types of workloads we've been handling. So when we started this thing in the early in two thousands, is I well when transactions started. I, a business transaction was the same as a computer transaction. And that was back in the 60s, 70s. And today, the business transaction spans lots of transactions, lots of little activities. In fact, it may go on for days, months, weeks. So it's a long process. Workflow evolved in order to glue those things together to understand what a full business transaction was. So we use the word transaction but it's really the little element in a bigger scope of things. And what we saw was workflow evolving into, or computer architectures evolving, software architectures, to be able to glue together various parts, various activities into the overall business transactions. And so seeing the microservices and micro, those strategies coming forward is we rationalized that what we needed was to have this little small thing that we're doing, this little elemental thing we're doing, run extremely fast, extremely high availability with extreme distribution. So that was where we started and that's where we're at now. Truly, this is 2010 was the evolution of databases or the transaction and database being an element with inside an overall business transaction and how we would evolve to meet that need out another decade or two. And that's where we are at this moment in time. So where do I see things going? Where I see things going is right now, we end up replicating a database, an entire database. So there's no geographic partitioning going on. So you may want to put something in Tasmania and something in uh, Los Angeles and keep them separated but yet together if you will if that makes sense. So true geographic distribution with backup recovery integrating in in it and evolving the system but it is does start from this notion of a consistently strong database that is distributed and easy to manage and and uh, and and high performance. So so we so that's the crossroad of where we're at right now. Thanks for that, Don. Um, Srini, any last words to add? No, it's um, I just encourage people to go um, try the database out, and um, I think I think you will find that there are a lot more use cases uh, which Aerospike can now support than we supported even last year. Right, so, so thanks a lot for attending. And um, you know, there's a lot more going on here at Summit 2020. Um, I encourage you to take advantage of, of all of it. Um, and uh, there's so much more in the database, as Srini said, even than last year. So if you looked, you know, six months ago, there's a, a lot for you. And if you looked at it a year ago, um, there's an incredible amount more. 
So thanks again, and thanks to you, Don, for, for helping us out here. And Srini, um, keep up the great work. <laughs>